chest. One, two. There's something up at this, uh, with this mic there. Test one, two. Okay. And if you're live, uh, we're great. Uh, hey, we. Uh, Nick over here. Let's say. And. Uh, Pray for him, Father. That and every lives he's touched over the years, and we can celebrate, and that he just has a fantastic day. Um, just celebrate what you have made him to be. We're just grateful for his spirit and his talents, and we just uh, want to sing happy birthday now to him. Here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Nick. Happy birthday to you. All right. Give thanks. Give thanks. Our God in. Sing. Sing. With a out is his love Setting sun. Yes, forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us, forever, yes, and forever.
Amen. His love endures forever. Couldn't be any more clear than that, right? Hey, if you're uh, new here, we're just glad that you joined us this morning in worship. Uh, we are Journey Roseburg here, and we've been existing here for almost five years, coming up in five years. And we're a church that really just allows the freedom for people to come in as they are. Come as you are is what we say. And uh, go ahead, Phil, go ahead and start us out. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Day after day, night after night, I will remember you're with me in this fight. Although the battle, it rages on, the war's already won. I know the war's already won. Surely my God is the strength of my soul, yeah. Your love defends me, your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me, your love defends me. We sing hallelujah. You're my portion, my salvation, hallelujah. Your mercy is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me, your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Yeah. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, yeah. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. Sing hallelujah. We sing hallelujah, you're my portion, my salvation, hallelujah, you're my portion, my salvation, sing hallelujah. You're my portion, my salvation. Amen. Love our little worshipers up front here. That's great. Kathy, you missed our happy birthday to your son. We, we did all that. You missed all the fun and celebrating. We have ki <laughs> Okay, we can do that. For mom's sake, we got to do happy birthday again. Ready? Yeah. Happy birthday to you. Proud mom here. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Nick. Happy birthday to you. Now, whoever gets it twice. All right. 
Father, we have not lost our focus. We are worshiping you, celebrating the lives of great people here. So um, we're going to continue with our worship. Uh, great song. I'm going to have Brandon lead us into this. still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me yet the mountains and I believe 
I see it, do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I see it, do it again. I see it, do it again. You may clap before the Lord. Amen. That's a great. I'm sorry when I just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. Yes, I'm sorry when I just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I open up my heart to you. I'm 
I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. I'm not here for blessings Oh Jesus, you don't owe me anything More than anything that you can do I just want you I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, Jesus, nothing else will do. I just want you to get out. Nothing else, nothing. Nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you, yes. Nothing else, nothing. And nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do, yes. I just want you, yeah. And nothing else, yes. Nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do, yes. I just want you, yes, nothing else, yeah, nothing else, nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence, yes, I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings yes. Jesus, you don't owe me More than anything that you can do, I just want you. That's our desire this morning, Lord. As we worship you, that we would want nothing else to be in your presence. To be near you, to see you more clearly. Father, may you be blessed with our worship this morning through the words we have spoken. That we would not treat this time as just another Sunday morning experience, but that this is a daily walking with you and following you and earnestly desiring to be in your presence. That's our desire. That's our hope each day as we walk into this crazy world. <laughs> Father, you've given us the hope and joy only found through, through you. And we're grateful for the grace. Father, move those mountains that get in the way of us drawing more near to you. 
You can do anything, the scripture tells us. So, Father, we ask this morning that you would do your great work in our hearts, that our hearts and minds would be open to the receiving of your word right now through Jeff. And thank you again that we can spend these moments talking to you and learning that peace that only you can give. We love you, Lord. Amen? All right. Jason, welcome. Thank you. We got some goodies here. Got some goodies. Welcome, everybody. Good journey morning, huh? I love Sunday morning. Everybody who's online, uh, we've been thinking about you. Welcome. We hope you're having a, a wonderful morning. What great worship. I drove down here from Oak Ridge, so an hour and a half drive, and I listened to worship the whole way here. I feel like I'm floating, so uh, really great. Um, that wasn't me, just so you know. Um, you know, as a church, we're, we're getting ready for Easter, and we're praying for revival. We don't even know what that means for our church. We're asking God um, to help us with that. And um, so I just want to encourage everybody uh, to think about that and pray, pray about that. And if you have things you want to share with us, share with us about that, because uh, we want to hear what you have to say. Um, I heard today uh, the University of Notre Dame did a, a study on the cost of ungenerous ungener hearts. And the cost of ungenerous hearts is anxiety. So that's the I, me, mine, I need more, I don't have enough kind of philosophy. And the other way to say that is a generous heart rewards us with happiness. Uh, it releases us from the obsession of self-absorption. And I thought, isn't that great? Right? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think the thing I like the most about Sunday mornings uh, is that you guys, whether you're online or in person, but especially those of you who are here in person, you're choosing to share yourself with me and with each other. And I feel like that's a sacrifice. That's a choice and a challenge you're making. And I appreciate it. I love coming in here and seeing you and you know, I'm okay with elbow connections or ankle connections or, you know, staying a little further apart, but I love seeing you. I love being in this space with you, and I love worshiping God together. And um, so, you know, I just want to say that um, you guys all know, you know, we have an app. Uh, you can give on the app. We have these beautiful red boxes that someone made, and you can put envelopes in those boxes. You know, I think this is a time where we can think about what does generosity look for uh, like for us? And certainly um, bringing our resources into our home to share it with our mission that we're here together uh, to impact our world is a great way to express your generosity. But it doesn't preclude your choices to do it somewhere else. You know, you can, you can look at your neighbor, you can meet needs, you can share time, you can bring food. Uh, we actually have a few people, um, Doug and Patty, so they have a daughter that had a stroke, and then Doug's dealing with some stuff. Uh, we have uh, another person in our church, you know, who just went through some surgery, um, significant surgery, and is going to have follow-up on that. And, um, you know, so anything you can do, you know, bring food, whatever the things are. Uh, interesting. The Woods actually just created, this is only half of our mailboxes, but they created a church mailbox. And so all the church families, uh, if you're not listed, we're going to keep trying to add you. Let us know. You can text us and let us know if you don't see. It's currently alphabetized. We'll see how long it lasts that way. But, you know, we, we have a, a mailbox for everybody. But, you know, mailboxes aren't very useful if there's not something in them and there's not a reason to check them. So, you know, a generous heart could think about each other and, you know, what's a nice thing that you appreciate about other people? Or someone who really irritates you, which that happens to me, ignore that part and think about God made them for a 
for this time and this season and this purpose? And what can you see that God put in them? Or what word from God do you think uh, you can share with them? But, but share your generosity. And, uh, and it will free us from our own self-absorption. I got a few announcements. And I'm not going to share everything I have today because I just have too much. Um, next weekend on Saturday, we have a men's breakfast. And I hear the testimony is going to be outstanding. So if you want to hear the testimony, 8 o'clock next Saturday here, uh, we do a little bit of Bible study, we share some food, and we get to hear a testimony, and it's just, it's just a wonderful thing. Um, uh, I'll end with this. Um, the acronym FEAR, uh, you guys have probably all heard it, but it's false expectations appearing real, right? And the, I was thinking about that this morning, and I'm thinking, I hate false expectations because everything's sold on fear, right? Fear or greed is what sells anything more than anything else. And um, so I was thinking, real expectations appearing possible. That's reaping. That's really what we want. But what are real expectations appearing possible? And, you know, it brought me back to the word. God gives us many, many, many promises. You can pick any of them. And what he says is, is true. It's true for you. It's true for me. And it's true for everyone else around. That's why we gather together. And so you can pick any of those expectations. And you can believe on those. And um, for about a week, I've been reminding myself that I am what I repeat. So I'm trying not to repeat things of fear. But I'm trying to re repeat things that I will reap. And people around me will reap. So that, that's what I have. And uh, thank you so much. Well, welcome, everyone. It's good to see you. And um, looking forward to, um, well, really, I'm looking forward to Easter. And um, it's only a month away. So, again, for those of you that aren't familiar with, maybe you're new to our church, uh, we had a tradition we started the first year. It's called Blossoming the Cross. And we have a cross that uh, we've always put inside the service. And uh, you'd, during the worship, you would come in and you would put flowers on this big old gnarly looking cross and then we'd erect it during the worship service and it was just so beautiful. But last year since the pandemic came, we decided to put that cross out on the front porch and let people in the community come as early as sunrise and come and just blossom that cross whenever they see. And it was a, it was a big hit. So we're looking forward to that. That's one of our expressions here about you know, putting a, a flower on a cross really can mean many things, but you make it mean what it means to you, but really it's to remember the most significant event in our faith. Got me going up? Okay. So um, we are in the beginning of a new series. We just finished one on fear that I think Jason was just highlighting that we should be focused more on reaping than fearing, and I love that, but um, we're actually an, uh, at the beginning of a brand new series. I love new series. For those of you that um, are, are used to inviting people to come to church, I think you can invite people to this church anytime. We have cards out there that says, I love this church, and we listen for three knots, and if you hear any of those, like, I'm not in church, not doing well, or, and those knots, you hear someone say that, you say, really? You should come to my church this Sunday. That's really what the card says, but there's no better time to, to invite someone to church to get on the front end of a, a series because then it's not like, you know, coming to a show where you miss the first half hour, right? So, but it's just a great time. But every day is a great day to invite someone to church. And um, here's another thing, you know, just to back out of the direction, I'm getting ready to go into the message, but, you know, with Easter coming, with the hope that maybe, maybe the world is going to be letting a little bit of air out of this fear of the pandemic thing. Who knows? People might start coming back to church more. Um, we're going to need two things, and we as leadership in the church are taking a serious look at what we need to prepare, and we are way under bathroomed for this church. We are way under toileted, so we've got this, uh, you know, outhouse for emergency purposes out there. We are taking a serious look at, at um, funding what it would take and to putting people in that project. Also, we're looking at a project to maybe put some sails or put some wood structure over the patio as well, just to make it a more welcoming feel when people come in. So those are projects we're going. But also, I'm telling you what, if we're going to start inviting people back to church, that means families will start coming back to church. And that means kids will start coming back to church more. 
and so I'm telling you, this is the biggest need we have. We need children's workers. So I would just love for you to just get involved. It's a meaningful way to be a part of the kingdom. So uh, having said all that, uh, let's, let's just move on. I'm looking forward to what we have to share today. Um, before we get into this, I just want to say one last thing just about, it's, it's actually a truth that's going to kind of frame uh, what we're talking about today. If you're new to Christianity, I just want to put a slide up here that just gives you the four basic truths of what uh, the gospel or what Christianity really is based on, okay? So this is going to become relevant for you. Let me just put these up here. Um, number one, four basic truths of the gospel or four basic truths of what it means to be a follower of Jesus or to enter into a relationship with God starts with these four statements. You have to come to two uncomfortable truths. The first two, number one, is that you're a sinner. It's not an easy thing to admit. It's actually a lot of, where a lot of people just, that's as far as they can go because they really can't define sin. They really don't know what it is. I might be a mistaker, uh, but I don't even know what that word sin means. So, um, but you have to come to that conclusion, and God helps people understand that one. The next one is that I deserve judgment. It's another uncomfortable truth. Nobody likes to hear that. In fact, uh, Scripture goes out in, in first, 2 Corinthians 9, it says, you know, um, it's appointed for man who wants to die and face judgment. And nobody likes to hear that, you know. And um, it, it, it really does make us think that if you embed these, these two truths, that I'm a sinner and I deserve judgment into your life, it really does beg the, the, a couple other serious questions that lead us to these other two truths. And the other two truths that Jesus actually was sent by God and he came to pay the price that you would have to pay in judgment for your own sins. And the last truth is amazing. It's the one that Easter was based on. It's that he rose from the grave to prove not only that he conquered the penalty that you and I deserve to pay, which is death, but he also rose again to prove many things, one of which is he wants to be the Lord of your life and he has the right to do so because he came back from the dead. These truths are your basic, basic Christian message. For those of you that are new or maybe wondering what Christianity is all about, I'm telling you, God could be speaking to someone right now, and I'm telling you, you bow your head and say, I, I confess those four things, God. Well, let me just tell you, welcome to the family of God, if you do that. Because those, if God's telling you that's true for you, that's the foundation of what it means to be a follower of Jesus and to enter into a relationship with the God who loves you. Okay. Having said all this, you'll see how this, some of this would become relevant in our message today. We're going to go through a series called Defining Moments. And defining moments, let me just define what a defining moment, moment might be for the purpose of our series. A defining moment, we'll just say, is a moment in your life where suddenly, out of nowhere, all of a sudden a truth is presented or revealed or it comes front and center in your life. And when that truth is revealed, we're forced to make a decision. We have to do something. And there are defining there, there's defining moments in all kinds of arenas of your life. You can have a defining moment in your marriage where one of the spouse just, or one of you comes to the other and says, you know, I'm just going to reveal a defining truth to you. If things don't change, I'm out of here. That's a defining moment. There are defining moments in your parenting. When you as a parent are parenting your kids and whether or not you were, you know, you were willfully trying to not be revealed to the truth you were afraid was true, or um, you, all of a sudden one day your youth comes to you and brings truth to bear and you realize this is a defining moment for parenting. There are defining moments in your relationships. If you're single and you're in a relationship and you come to that place where you need to propose, you realize you need to do that, and you know, I'm, but you're just waiting for that opportune moment. You're waiting for that defining moment for it to happen. We have defining moments all kinds. We have defining moments in our finances, defining moments in our future planning if you're in college or if you're just looking to open a business. I mean, these are defining moments, defining moments we have all over the place, but the most significant area we're going to be looking at is defining moments in your spiritual life. Where suddenly we're faced with a truth. It can be a truth you knew all along. Or it could be a brand new truth. Most of the time, this truth is uncomfortable. 
like those two truths in the basic gospel. Most of the time, they're uncomfortable and they're glaring and it's hard to stand. You feel like squirming when you're in that truth. And you have a choice you're forced to make. You will either embrace it or you will squirm and you'll pretend and you'll ignore it. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to look into the New Testament, kind of leading up to Easter, of all the interactions that Jesus had. And actually, we're going to carry it on after Easter, too, because there's a bunch of people that I want to reveal from the scriptures. So Jesus interacting with people, and in his interactions, he constantly would bring people to a defining moment. And uh, it, it would usually um, bring a terrible or difficult truth to bear. And they like this. They would either be forced to squirm and ignore or run away from this truth, or they would fully embrace it. And you know that Jesus actually was sent to earth, not just to die for our sins. Do you know that? His, one of his primary defined um, purposes for coming to earth, beyond dying for the penalty of our sin, was actually just a basic thing. His desire was to reveal God to people, to let people know what God was really like. And I'm telling you, that area was a defining moment for so many people when Jesus would reveal what God is really like to people in such a way that they were either uncomfortable and would run away or they would squirm under that uncomfortability of it and ponder it and embrace it and be changed forever. So, which one's going to happen today in our story? We'll find out. Uh, before we get into it, we're going to be in John chapter 4. If you want to follow along in your book or you can follow along in your little you know, phone or whatever you do. Um, but we're in John chapter 4. The verses will be on the screen. Let me give you a context. Um, in um, 720 BC, there was an Assyrian king named Sargon, okay? And it was a looming kingdom, Assyria, the northern ten kingdoms or, or tribes of northern Israel, because at this point in 720 BC, the nation Israel was split. And the northern ten tribes had heard that Assyria was coming. Well, Sargon finally came in 720 BC, and what he did is conquered the area, and he slaughtered many. He, he pretty much left behind almost nothing, scattered the rest. Basically, all the Israelites that were remaining left over were basically vagrants, homeless, people that had hid in caves. And when Sargon left, they came out of the caves with nothing, no houses. And, and, and so there was just a few people left in northern Israel. Well, eventually, the Assyrian kingdom went north, went east, and went west and conquered, and they conquered other lands, and they would constantly do the same. And it turned out that the northern ten tribes area of Israel was populated with homeless, vagrant, looking for safety people from all different races all over the world, and they, would all, they kind of all came back into the northern kingdoms. So it wasn't just Jewish people there. And so what happened in 605 B.C. is a guy named Nebuchadnezzar came and he conquered the southern two tribes. And he deported uh, about 60,000 people over to the Babylonian area. Some of them were da Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel. We looked at that story. But when they were there, they lived there 70 years. And then at 444 B.C., when, when a bunch of people were sent back to build the, the temple and so on, they, um, they, uh, they came back and found that in the Samaritan area, there were these Jewish people who for 150 to 200 years had been intermarrying with lots of other people from all over the world. So they really didn't even consider them to be Jewish people. Yeah, they had Jewish roots, but for the most part, the real pure-blooded Jewish people who were deported and stayed purely Jewish over in Babylon returned purely Jewish, and when they, they, they judged the people from the northern kingdoms that was there. They barely, they just wouldn't even recognize them. They treated them badly. They, they actually refused to have anything to do with them. They wouldn't acknowledge their, their, their way of life, their system. They wouldn't even let them come to Israel to worship. In fact, it was so bad. Um, if the pure-blooded Jews living in southern Israel wanted to travel north to, let's say, a resort town up in the Sea of Galilee, 
they would never go through Samaria, okay? If you wanted to, that's the shortest route if you wanted to come from Jerusalem is to go up through Samaria. Instead, if you were a pure-blooded Jew, you would actually go the long way around just to avoid the area. You would add an extra day to the trip. And that's just the way they dealt with it. And in this particular story we're going to be looking at is a story about pure-blooded, southern Israeli Jew man, Jesus, and he's on a trip north. And he decides to be efficient and go through Samaria with his disciples. All right? John chapter 4, verse 3. So, he, Jesus, left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Uh, No doubt, he was going probably to his hometown, Nazareth, which is not far from Galilee, the, the Sea of Galilee. Now, it's this it's interesting little detail that John gives us. Now, it says he had to go through Samaria. And, of course, we know he didn't have to go through Samaria. Okay? But on this occasion, the Apostle John wants us all to know that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, okay, this time we're going through Samaria. And that had to make them feel uncomfortable, but they were like, okay, you're the, you're the rabbi. And on his way through, he decides to have a conversation with a woman. And this isn't just any woman. This is a, a Samaritan woman, and she's a woman with a past, okay? We actually find out this woman was married uh, not one time, not two times, not three times, not four times. She was married five times, which, to be honest, even in our culture, that's weird, right? That's crazy. It would be extraordinary in their culture, right? In fact, we find out that not only was she married five times, that she was now not married, and she had found a new arrangement with some guy who she wasn't married to, and she was living with them. So, Let's just say this woman he has a conversation with is a woman with a past, a woman with issues. She had a public past, too. She lived in this small town also, Sikhar. It's a small town where everybody knew everybody, all right? I'm normally, I, I came from San Diego, was born in a huge town. It's pretty easy to hide your past. In fact, I, when I moved here, this is the first time I planted a church uh, in, a, in what I would call a smaller town. It was interesting how many people come um, out of the woodwork because the pastor doesn't know them. <laughs> it's kind of weird. I said, just come on, that's okay. So when I meet you, I know nothing about you. Isn't that nice? So, but she's from this town, it's a small town where everybody knew everybody, and she had a public past. She could not hide from her past. And maybe she wasn't living there her whole life. I bet that half the people in the town knew knew she was married multiple times. My guess is she's also someone who moved around from town to town because to get away from her past and landed in Sikar, and people would piece together that she had a past. They may not know every detail about the past, but she had one. And we don't know why she was married five times. We really don't. It's not in the story. But even if she had been married five times, not her fault, all five died. She was a widow five straight times. At the very least, the people of that town would think she is, she's probably cursed, okay? Don't, just don't marry that girl, okay? You'll probably die, right? But maybe she was at work, that would be at best. If she was married uh, five times because maybe she just can't nail down a relationship, she kept leaving the guy. At worst, she actually would be viewed like a prostitute. In fact, this was very common if you were a prostitute. Prostitutes' wildest dream is just like the movie, um, you know, what's that movie um, with Julia Roberts? Pretty Woman. Your dream is to marry the guy. Some some knight in shining armor, and one day you're going to marry the guy, and she might have been a prostitute that was hopefully trying to hope that this guy is the one guy that can rescue me out of this lifestyle and get set me up, and I'll finally be legitimate and so it could be likely that this was her either she couldn't nail down a relationship or you know she just kept cycling through these relationships 
and we don't know, maybe she was married five times, maybe because she was barren, she couldn't have children, and that was very valuable, you know? Uh, if that were true, she would be viewed as worthless. Or maybe she was married five times because she'd been abused, who knows? And therefore, she hated men. You know, whatever her story was, she was a woman with a past, a difficult past, and she had lots of issues in her past. And, and we don't really know why she'd been married five times, but there's one thing that we do know from this story is that she was thirsty. She was very thirsty. Thirsty at least to not be viewed to, by people as this. But maybe also for another reason, we know, we know that she was thirsty for relationships. We know that she was thirsty for friendships. For one simple detail, she went out to this well at high noon. You know what? Usually when people go out to get water, they get it to, to, to perform the duties of that day. And they do it early first thing in the morning so they can get their things done. But she wouldn't go out at high noon. She would go out well after all of those other women were not there. And so you can imagine this woman desperate and thirsty for relationships, for friends. So getting into the story, Jesus, he's traveling north with his disciples. He's heading uh, through Samaria to the Galilee. They get to Sychar, and it's high noon, and Jesus stops at this well and sends all of his disciples into Sychar to get food. And no doubt, as the 12 disciples walk into town, this woman's walking out, and she passes them, doesn't make any eye contact with them, certainly no conversation. But she had to notice that they were Jewish men from the way they were dressed or whatever. They just weren't from around there, and they were coming north. And it had to catch her by surprise. Why are these men coming? What in the world? Why are they, why are they in my city? And so she passes them, and remember, she came all by herself. And as she gets there, there sitting at the edge of the well was one lone figure. And little did she know this was her defining moment. It says, so she came to a town. He came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. It becomes a little relevant that uh, this is about Jacob's well. But Jacob's well, Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, he sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. That's, that's Hebrew for high noon, okay? When a, when a Samaritan woman came to draw her water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Now, this is weird. Remember, um, no doubt she was already weirded out by, by passing the 12 Jewish men on the way, you know, out towards the well. And, of course, she made no eye contact, had no conversation. And so she just gets there, and she sees another Jew man sitting there by the well, and sort of, she doesn't know what to do. She's really weirded out by this, okay? And so she, I think she just probably busied herself, put her nose down, didn't look up, and just started doing her drawing of a water thing and just thinking, okay, pretty soon this will be over. You know, someone's here. It's great. I'm really not happy that someone's here. Um, and she probably just put her head down. And, and as she's working, eventually Jesus initiates conversation with her. And he looks at her. He looks at her and he says, Would you please, would you please draw water out and, and would you give me a drink from your bucket and let, my, my, let me put my lips to your jar? And of course, she doesn't answer yes or no, actually. She just actually is taken quite aback. So, first I think she's shocked that he's talking to her and, and, and it's weird, a Jew man is asking to put his perfect holy lips to my unholy, worthless jar. And, and remember, I'm not, I'm not just a Samaritan, I'm a Samaritan woman. So she's totally off balance. And she answers him pretty straightly. She just says to him, you know, let me just point out a truth here. You're a Jew. You know that, right? She's like, he's like, good observation. <laughs> you know, you are a Jew. You realize that there's a problem here immediately. I am not just a Samaritan. I am a Samaritan woman. Okay? 
And she just literally asked, how is it you could even think of asking me for a drink? And then Jesus answered her, and it's so great. People don't say this, okay? He answers her, if you knew the what? The gift. If you only knew the gift of God and who it is, if you knew two things, there's a tremendous gift that God wants to give all people. And not only that, there's only one person that can give it to you. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you eternal life, living water. Right. And at this point, I think she hears something that like nobody, nobody says things like this. This isn't something normal people say. I believe at this point, she's probably wondering, okay, this is like a scripted line you might read out of a Hollywood movie. Someone's saying, you don't know who I am, do you? You know, it's just weird. So she had, I had to start sensing this was a defining moment, or at least he was trying to frame it as one. And I think she perked up and she probably paused at him and she says, sir, you know, first, if you're going to get a drink, you're missing something. Okay, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, so you better have long arms, okay? And, and, and what's this living water you're talking about? Are you greater than, now this is key, are you greater than our father, Jacob? Now, I don't know, if you don't, may not realize this, but with that phrase, our father, Jacob, she's actually picking a fight, okay? Because the Jews would never use the pronoun our with anything Bible related. No Bible name would, she, would a Jew person with pure blood even throw out in a conversation as if they shared religious heritage. And so she's picking a fight here. She says, our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and livestock. Of course, she, she's assuming most Jewish people they have a short fuse with, with Samaritans. We think she, she's probably thinking Jesus is going to turn on her and this conversation be over. And so maybe sensing this loaded conversation, she kind of diverts to the hour, you know, father, father's well, and you're telling me you have something better than what Jacob, big Bible name person that we can look to. And Jesus answered this way. He said, you know, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. You know, that's not new information. And then he says, verse 14, but whoever, and here it is, whoever gives, gets this water that I give them, who says that? Normal people don't say this. Who, whoever gets the water that I give them will never thirst. And he says, indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of of water welling up to eternal life. Now, when she heard this, again, she had to be thinking, norm, normal people do not say these things. This is so strange. And he's speaking kind of cryptically. You know, I'm not even sure what, what all this means. I don't even know if I understand it. But deep down, I bet she couldn't help but feel, look, he's trying to frame a defining moment for me. It's clear. Because who says, I mean, if you had any idea who I was, and if you only knew what I had to offer you, you wouldn't have waited for me to ask you. You would ask me, and I would give you the thing that deep down, maybe you're not in touch with that thing that you know you need deepest in your life. Who says that? So the story goes on. So the woman says, sir, you got to give me this water even if she's kind of going with it, okay? Maybe it is kind of cryptic sounding, but let's just assume for a second, you can give me water, I'll never have to drink again. Sir, you know, give me this water. Give it to me so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water because we know how painful it is to have to come when no one else is around in the middle of the day and, and avoid all other relationships. 
So she probably means this in some way. I think she's looking at him and saying, sir, look, I've never met you before. Um, something in me tells me this is kind of the beginning of a defining moment. But trust, if you have something to offer me that I need that would solve maybe a thirst in my life, I'm telling you, I want you to give it to me. And so right here, in fact, Jesus, I think he's reeling her in right here. And then Jesus does something, in my opinion, is unimaginable. I tell you what, if, uh, if I did this for you, you, to you, you would leave. This is one of those uncomfortable things he's about to do. And, and uh, frankly, if you had a counselor who did this to you, you wouldn't pay for the service. You would just leave. If, if you had friends that did this, it would end your friendship, okay? Right here, when he's reeling her in, he's got this defining moment that's beginning with her, and she's all, look, I'm not sure what living water is. I'm not even sure what eternal life is. But something in me tells me that there's something about this guy. And you know what? Every other man in my life's tried to abuse me. Everybody, all other guys have, have not been good to me. And here's a guy that's having a meaningful conversation with me. And he tells me he's willing to give me something that might satisfy my deepest thirst in life. And as she's beginning to open herself up to him, Jesus does this so insensitive thing. He says to her, um, go call your husband and come back. I mean, oh, can you just feel, I mean, I've, I've been a pastor for over 25 years, and I'm telling you, this has never worked for me. It might work for Jesus, but this has never worked for me. I can, I can do it my kids every once in a while. I can pull them into that uncomfortable light sometimes. But it's hard to just be this straight with someone's past. And of course, he knows she's not married, we find out. Why does he even use the word husband? So crazy. He just goes right over here and he just opens a wound and just sort of rips the scab off and just... She said, you know, for the life of me, it's weird. In fact, um, I think she's being really, but she, she goes, I think she goes back to just drawing water after this question. She's like, oh, great. This guy knows my past, right? So she says, okay, I have no husband. And she just starts busying herself with the well, starts drawing water, and I think there's a long pause. And finally, I think Jesus says to her, okay, You're right. You're right when you say you have no husband. But the fact is, in fact, the truth we're about to come to bear, the uncomfortable truth is that you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. She had to be saying, okay, I've been moving away from small town to small town to small town to get away from people knowing exactly how many husbands I have had. It's hard for me to, to deny that people will eventually find out I've been at least divorced once, probably twice, probably maybe some will find out three times. But this guy nailed it. He knows I've been married five times. Not only that, he knows that I gave up on the institution a long time ago. And the guy that I'm now with, I've worked out an arrangement. He doesn't need to marry me, and we just sort of make life work. How did he know? And that's her truth. That's her uncomfortable truth. And you know why Jesus does this? It's so important. Jesus does, you know why he makes her so uncomfortable? You know, by the way, do you know why sometimes you get uncomfortable you go to church two or three times and then all of a sudden you get real uncomfortable and then you don't come back for two or three times or something and 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 i think that jesus does this be because he's he wants to do with her in this defining moment what i think he wants to do with every single person and here's all he does jesus puts her in touch with her deepest thirst her deepest thirst he suddenly abruptly, even painfully, uncomfortably puts her in touch. He, he brings truth to bear and puts her in touch with her deepest thirst. 
And it's kind of his way of, in the middle of this conversation, just saying, okay, before we go any further, let's just admit something. It's okay to admit this. Just admit this, okay? Life has left you thirsty. Life has left you thirsty. It, either it was decisions you've made or decisions others have made that affected you. It's it really no one to blame, but life has left you thirsty, right? A, a, in fact, it's okay to admit, even not only the decisions you made and other people's made has left you thirsty, but your attempts to satisfy your own thirst after those things has left you thirsty as well. Hasn't it? And suddenly, she's standing in the blaring, uncomfortable light of truth because truth has come to bear. And she's squirming and she's squinting and it's hard to see. You know when you're standing in a blinding light, you can't see anything? And if you run away, you'll be okay. But if you stand there, your eyes can adjust to it after just a little while. So she decides to stay there and let things adjust because it's really uncomfortable. And so she says to the man, Jesus, the woman says, look, I, um, oh, this is not it. Verse 19, can you guys see that? I actually didn't make the slide there. Sir, the woman said, she says, I can see that you're a prophet. <laughs> That's like, okay, let's get through this awkward moment, okay? Let's get through this. And from here, she diverts and she begins having a conversation about something safe. She starts talking about theology. You know, you could talk theology all day and never have any personal feelings about it. I mean, it's easy to talk about religious stuff and not about your past. So she, she, she diverts and, and she brings up these theological arguments and she brings up how the Jews had this mountain and the Samaritans worship on this mountain. She wants to have a theological discussion about worship here or worship there. She brings up the Jewish heritage, the Samaritan heritage and blah, blah, blah. And Jesus is honestly so gentle. He actually lets her take the conversation in a different direction. And, and, and he goes with it because and, and things are feeling a little bit safer. She lets, he lets her take the subject in a different direction. He lets her talk about theology, and she's like, good, because I do not want to talk about that uncomfortable, painful past of mine. And, and he goes with it away from the personal stuff, and here's the key. The next chunk of verses, Jesus simply has a long conversation with her about whatever she wants to talk about, and he just lets her guide it through all those things non-difficult, safe topics to talk about. And then finally, verse 25, the woman look, looks at him and says, okay, well, I know, and this is the summary statement, I know that, you know, Messiah called the Christ is coming, and when he comes, he will, you know, he'll explain everything to us. And this was the end statement. This was like, okay, church is over. All right, um, that was uncomfortable. I made it through. I may not come back again, but thank you very much. We know the Messiah is going to come one day. He'll explain everything to us. Bye-bye. Okay, see you later. And she's packing her things up, and she's trying to get out. And, and, and then he looks at her in the eye, and he's like, okay, Messiah, now, now we're talking. Now we're talking about something I know something about. Because, I mean, now she's revealing something. We know that this woman was, was thirsty in life, that life had left her thirsty for being called anything but those horrible names. We know that she was thirsty for relationships. We know that she was thirsty for worship because she brought it up. But now she reveals she's thirsty for Messiah. And Jesus takes that one piece and he says this last thing where he says, Jesus declared, I, the one who is speaking to you, am he. And, he's, and she sets her water jugs down, and she recognizes this is her defining moment. Because suddenly, as she's listening to him, she senses that in this moment, truth has been brought to bear, and the truth that she begins to sense, this guy is actually the Messiah. And, and she doesn't run from it, and she embraces it. And look at the detail now John gives. Then, leaving her water jar, I love this part. He leaves, she leaves her water jar, that thing that represented her ongoing insatiable thirst. She leaves her water jar and went back to the town and said to the men of the town, some, some translations say uh, 
the people of the town, but I actually think she went to the leaders of the town, the men leaders of the town, and she pled with them. And they said, come see, I love this line, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. And I think the men of the town listened to her say that and said, come on, everybody knows everything you ever did, (laughs) right? I mean, we may not know all of the details, but we pretty much know. It's not hard to piece it together, you know? And of course, you know, she, she hears them, say, she's saying, no, you got to come and see this person. He, he doesn't just know everything I ever did. He knows more. He, it, it's way more than that. In fact, wildly different. This is a guy who talked to me even though he knew everything I ever did. He actually had a conversation with me. He knew the things I was thirsty for in life. I was thirsty to sit and just interact with somebody. And it was something in his voice that though he knew everything I ever did, he didn't condemn me. I didn't feel ashamed. I could see it in his eyes. He had a long conversation with me and he loved me anyway. And so she ends, she ends by saying to the guys, could this be the Messiah? Could it be? She's inviting them to go check it out for themselves. And of course, there was something so different in her. She was so passionate about it. She was so uh, compelling in the way that she was speaking about this interaction she had. The leaders of the town just had to take a chance. So they go out and they, they, they go meet Jesus. They talk with him. And they learn that he really did know every, sing that, every single thing that she ever did. And I, I, I got to be honest. If I was one of those guys out there, I'd be like wondering if he could do me. <laughs> right? And I wonder if Jesus, at the end of it, just said, you want me to do you? I bet he could. And I bet he did, actually. You know why I think so? Because of the reaction in the next verse. Look at the men of the town says. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. And he told some of those men everything they ever did. And he knows everything you ever did. And the truth finally came to bear. That even though he knows everything you ever did, he's a God who doesn't condemn you. He's willing to also be a a Messiah who doesn't, he's not afraid to go out of his way to wade into your life and even be willing to help bring uncomfortable truths to bear. To put you in touch with your deepest thirst and so that you can be look look at someone in in your life and say i need a messiah i need a savior i hope you're it so the whole town of sikar has a defining moment along with this woman because that one day the the truth was brought to bear and they all realized together the whole town together realized that life had left them thirsty and so they all embraced it together they knew that Jesus knew everything that they all ever did. And, and of course, they know everything we ever did. They also know everything we kept didding in our life to try to satisfy our own thirst, right? And so as we close, I just want to challenge you know, two groups of people. It, for one, if you're a Christian today, if you've been following Jesus, I just want you to just... Think about this. If you've been following Jesus, you know, we all, we all pursue things in our life apart from Jesus trying to satisfy our own thirsts, okay? And I just, I just think that we try to wring out of life and, and wring out of life all the worthless stuff that we really end up pursuing, just trying to quench the thirst deep down in your soul. So as we close, if you're following Jesus, just really simply, would you confess today that life has just left you thirsty and you need to look to Jesus? He's standing there saying, I know you're thirsty. It's okay to admit it. Just come to me. Let go of that thing. Let go of those things. You're, and you just need to confess and say, okay, I'm going to give up all those pursuits that I know are never going to satisfy my thirst. You need to do that today if you're a follower of Jesus. 
I do a lot of stuff trying to satisfy my own thirst. I need to go to Jesus. And just today, today I'm just done ditting, right? I, I'm, Jesus knows everything I ever did, and today I'm done ditting. And, and if you're not a Christian, really it's the same challenge. I want you to consider to confess that life has left you thirsty just like everybody else because that's true. Life has left us thirsty. And I want to add to you something, that, that maybe you can acknowledge that today is your defining moment, that you met Jesus, uncomfortable and painful as it may be, that he has brought truth to bear, and you might be willing to look to Jesus as your living water. So let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much. And with all our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to invite everyone in this room to consider if there is a part of their life that they know they need to just walk away from because there are things that we pursue in life that we go after them because we think they are going to quench the thirst, but they never do. So, Lord, I, I just pray that if there's someone in this room or someone watching online or listening, that today would be that defining moment where they look to you, Jesus, and simply just say, God, life is le leaving me thirsty, and it's because I refuse to walk away from the things that I keep doing to try to satisfy my own thirst. Lord Jesus, I walk away, I repent of those things. I leave them behind, never to return. And I follow headlong into my relationship with you, Jesus. And for the rest of you, with the heads bowed and eyes closed, I just ask, would you consider that today might be the day that's your defining moment where you just pray a simple prayer and say, Jesus, I realize that you know everything I ever did. You know everything I ever did, and you still love me. And I know today you stand before me in a defining moment, and you are offering me living water. And today, I want you to be my sole source of living water, trusting that you alone can quench my thirst. Father, thank you so much that there are people that are out there in this world that, will, that are looking for you to quench their thirst. And I really believe that as time goes on and your return to this earth gets nearer, that you are going to be tugging on the hearts of many, many people. And you're going to be opening up hearts to receive this living water more and more and more as time gets nearer the end. I pray today that many in this, uh, in this church or online or wherever they're listening, that they would open their hearts to you and so be satisfied forever. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. I'm looking forward to it. Good seeing you guys again, and uh, come back soon. Um, I do want to end with a couple things. We, ha we have some projects that we're, we're talking about doing, uh, an under-the-bridge ministry. There is also uh, a food drive we're talking about. We're also talking about a, a, a blood drive that's going to be after Easter. So I just want you to be all excited about different things coming up. And uh, if you're interested in children's ministry, come talk to me, my wife, or Hannah, or anyone else. And until then, just remember that finding and following Jesus is the greatest journey. Have a great week.